Welcome to Changes to the Condo Act for Buyers. Let's get started. In the previous unit, you learned about the five broad areas of changes to the Condo Act and the two new regulatory bodies overseeing the condo sector. In this unit, you will review other changes relevant to buyers of both pre-construction and resale condos, including record retention and access requirements, electric vehicle charging stations, and new standard forms. Let's begin by looking at this interaction between Abby, a real estate salesperson, and her client Elisa, who wants to buy a pre-construction condo from the builder. Take a moment to review their conversation. Click the arrows to toggle between scenes, and then click Next to answer a related question. Many of the changes to the Condo Act are specifically aimed at informing buyers of pre-construction condos. Can you think of some reasons why? That's right. Many pre-construction condos offer lower entry price points that attract many first-time buyers. They are new to the purchase process, to home ownership, and to condo living. Other pre-construction buyers may already own a home and could just be downsizing from a large family home to a condo. These buyers may also be unfamiliar with pre-construction purchases and with condo living. Buying pre-construction, whether it is a first-time buyer or someone downsizing, also means that the buyer is purchasing a property sight unseen. This means their decisions are based on documents provided by the builder, meant to support their marketing efforts, and subject to change at the builder's own discretion. Remember that pre-construction condo buyers are uniquely protected by a 10-day cooling off period after they sign an APS when they can back out of the deal no questions asked. No other real estate transaction enjoys this level of protection. Let's go back to Abby now, whose client Elisa wants to attend a release event. Abby feels she should learn more about condos before visiting any sales centers. Look at this interaction between Abby and Elisa before moving on. Click the arrows to toggle between scenes, then click Next to continue. Have you had a chance to look through these guides? If not, we recommend you become familiar with them and any other consumer resources. Send the buyer the links or print out the guides for them to review at home. Encourage them to take the time to read them carefully to learn more about buying and owning a condo. Then, sit down with your clients and review their questions before they sign an APS. To access the guides, check the resources Now, let's go into the changes this unit deals with, starting with record retention. How much do you know about Condo Act changes to record retention and access? Thank you for your input. This is what you need to know. 
Condo Act changes dealing with corporation records were aimed at providing standard rules for record retention, better access to a condo corporation's records at a set fee, and a dispute resolution process through the Online Condominium Authority Tribunal, or CAT. You must know about these changes because they apply to the information available to prospective buyers and to their future experience as owners and sellers. Refer to the course resources to learn about the CAT's dispute process. What are the current record retention periods? That's correct. Record retention requirements for condo corporations are 7 years at minimum for financial and operating records, 90 days at minimum from the date of the meeting for all proxy instruments, ballots, and recorded votes from meetings of owners, an unlimited retention period for other corporation documents such as current or unexpired versions of agreements and insurance policies. Records with no specific retention requirements must be kept for the period determined by the condo board. The minimum retention period could be extended in certain cases. Knowledge of record retention requirements helps you determine the type, amount, and age of information that is available to condo buyers, owners, and sellers. Records contain crucial information about the unit and the corporation. Knowing what's in them and how far back you can go to assess the health of the project gives you and your clients valuable insight that can shape their decision to buy or sell. But knowing about these records is one thing, and accessing them is another. Let's review the changes to record access. Which of the following are true about Condo Act changes on access to records? That's right. Changes to the Condo Act on access to records have resulted in standardized forms for record requests and for a corporation's response to requests. Mandatory timelines for a condo corporation to respond to record requests, which are 7 days for core records such as the current versions of the declaration, bylaws, rules, the current fiscal year budget, and minutes of meetings from the last 12 months. 30 days for non-core records. There are limits on fees a corporation can charge for record requests.
What does that look like in real life? And what are core and non-core records? Learn more about the process by clicking each item on screen. Record requests must be made in writing using the new standard form available on the Government of Ontario website. The request must specify which records are being requested, if they must be in hard copy or electronic format, or for in-person examination. The request must be made in relation to an individual's interest as a buyer, owner, or mortgagee. However, the individual making the request does not need to indicate the purpose of their request. Note that the buyer, owners, and mortgagees do not have a right to any records that contain personal information about employees of the corporation, records on pending litigation or insurance investigations, or personal information about specific units or owners. Refer to the course resources for the Request for Records form. Please note that the link provided takes you directly to the form, but it may not open properly on all browsers. The condo board must respond to record requests from buyers, owners, or mortgagees using a standard form available on the Government of Ontario's website. The response must specify a description of the records requested and whether any of the requests are for core records, an estimate of the fee to examine or make a copy of the record, a decision on if they will provide access to or copies of the records requested, where the records are available for an in-person examination. If the board denies access to a record, it must state the reasons why in the response and refer to any provisions in Section 55, Subsection 3 of the Condo Act or any other regulation that allows the corporation to refuse access. Refer to the course resources for the board's response to Request for Records form. Please note that the link provided takes you directly to the form but the form may not open properly on all browsers. After the party who made the request gets the response, they have 60 days to confirm the records they need and send payment of any fees. If not, the request is considered abandoned. If the condo corporation does not provide a response to the request, the request is considered abandoned unless the party making the request files a case with the CAT within six months.
Take a few minutes to click these items and read the on-screen content to learn more about types of records, fees, timing, and penalties. This is Oliver, a registrant. His client, Amber, is interested in purchasing a condo. When Oliver asks her if she needs an assigned parking spot, she replies that she does not own a car presently, but is considering buying a hybrid or electric vehicle in a couple of years. Oliver remembers hearing something new about this in the Condo Act. Which of the following statements is correct about changes to the Condo Act to electric vehicle charging stations in condos? That's correct. The Condo Act made it easier for corporations and owners to install charging stations for electric vehicles. This is a choice, not a requirement. Provisions outline the process when condo corporations want to obtain approval to install charging stations and when owners want to request and obtain approval for installing a charging station. The client asks Oliver some questions about charging stations. Read the statement on screen and determine if it is true or false. If the corporation initiates the process of installing a charging station in the common elements of the condo, they may be able to do so without an owner's vote. The corporation must follow the requirements of regulations. The steps the corporation must take depend on whether an owner's vote is required. Read the statement on screen and determine if it is true or false. If a corporation initiates the process, all costs are considered part of the common expenses and all owners, not just the users of charging stations, will pay for the installation based on their unit's proportional share of expenses in the declaration. What if the request comes from an owner? Does that change the process and distribution of costs? Which of the following are true aspects of an owner-initiated application? Not quite. Most of the planning and costs of an installation falls to the owner initiating the request, who must follow a three-step process. Click the button on screen to learn more.
The CAO has created the following resources on charging stations. A guide for owners and boards with required steps. Templates to help owners apply. And templates to help condo boards respond to applications. These resources are for guidance and are not mandatory. If having future access to an electric vehicle charging station is important to your client's decision to buy, you must advise them that the request to install an electric vehicle charging station may or may not be approved. If a charging station does not already exist, they must proceed with the full knowledge that they may have to secure other arrangements. Refer to the course's resources for CAO's step-by-step -step guide installing electronic vehicle charging systems and electric vehicle charging station templates. Oliver should know and tell his client Amber that if it is important to her decision to purchase a condo, he can search for information on charging stations in the status certificate, which is also a new standard form. If there are no current or contemplated stations, the client should know that this is a possibility she can work towards once she becomes an owner. However, Oliver should also advise his client that applying for a charging station does not guarantee an approval. He should also speak to her about some common matters of contention on charging stations, such as limited parking spaces and the costs of common electricity. Refer to the course resources to review the status certificate form. These new forms also happen to be our next topic.
Changes to the Condo Act resulted in several new standard forms, some mandatory and others optional. There are forms that apply to owners, buyers, to the board, and the condo corporation. You are expected to know these forms as they apply to different stages of a buyer client's purchase or to their interactions as an owner or even as a future seller. Let's start with the mandatory forms. Click each category of forms on screen to learn more. In addition to these mandatory forms, you can inform your buyer client about the new optional forms developed for several different purposes. Familiarize yourself with these forms and how to access them so you can advise your buyer clients how the forms are used once they assume ownership of their unit. Click each item on screen to learn more about each form. Refer to the course resources to access the condominium forms section of the CAO website. The link provided takes you directly to the forms page of the CAO, but the forms may not open properly on all browsers.